Hi, Benjamin from The Nature Podcast here. We are very close to the end of 2023. And as is tradition around these parts, we're going to take a look back at some of the stories we covered on the show over the past 12 months. In this special clip show, members of the team will each be picking out something they made in 2023 and telling us why it stood out to them. We've got a bunch of stories lined up, including how multi-sensory experiences can help make stronger memories, how AI helps researchers monitor biodiversity recovery in an Ecuadorian forest, and the curious way that elephant seals catch up on their sleep. All that is to come, but first, Nick Petrich Howe is here with his pick of 2023. So the story I've picked this year is an interesting one. I say the word story because we think we know what happened here, but actually we don't really, or at least time has sort of changed our understanding of this. So the story I'm talking about is about Rosalind Franklin's contribution to the discovery of the structure of DNA. And in this story, they found some new documents that shed a bit more light on that and helped us to understand how maybe we've misunderstood exactly what happened here and it was a very interesting one to put together so i hope you enjoy it again from our 26th of april show here's nick's pick of the year cambridge england 1953 in the eagle a pub and common haunt of cavendish lab staff two men burst through the door and breathlessly announce, we've, we've discovered the secret of life. This story is one you're likely familiar with. It's a famous anecdote from James Watson about how he and Francis Crick announced that they'd discovered the structure of DNA. And it most likely didn't happen. In a similar vein, you're probably also familiar with the story of how it wasn't actually just Watson and Crick behind this breathtaking discovery. Maurice Wilkins, who later shared the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick, and Rosalind Franklin were key to the breakthrough. In fact, almost as famous as the story of the eagle is the one that paints Franklin as a victim, whose data and the famous photograph 51 of the DNA helix were taken by Watson without her permission, helping him and Crick solve the structure whilst her role was diminished. But writing in Nature this week, two biographers of Watson and Crick are revealing how this isn't really true either. It does a disservice to Franklin to portray her as the brilliant crystallographer who was cheated out of the structure. No, she was an equal contributor. This is Nathaniel Comfort, a historian of medicine from Johns Hopkins, who's writing a biography of Watson. This perspective is in contrast to a widely held view that Franklin had missed crucial data, in particular a very clear image of DNA known as photograph 51, which then Watson stole to get the crucial insight. But according to Matthew Cobb, zoologist and biographer of Crick from the University of Manchester, this is just Watson's semi-fictionalised account. According to him, he sees photograph 51, he immediately realises DNA must be some kind of helix, and he and Crick then go on in the next few weeks to discover the structure. Now, the implication of that is that this photograph, which was taken by Franklin and her PhD student Raymond Gosling the year before, the implication of this is that Franklin, who was a very smart person, sat on this bit of data and didn't get it. Whereas Watson, who knew very little about X-ray crystallography, he took one glance at it and bingo, he instantly knew what it meant. And this just strikes any historian who studies this as being rather unlikely. And this rather unlikely account may have become even less likely with Matthew and Nathaniel's recent discovery of documents which put Franklin's contributions and the relationship between her, Watson, Crick and Wilkins in a different light. Let's go back to 1951. At this time, the structure of DNA was unclear. People knew that it had a phosphate backbone with A, T, C and G bases, but not a lot else. So in 1951, Franklin joined John Randall and Maurice Wilkins at King's College London. 
There, they were using X-ray diffraction, a method to determine the position of atoms in a structure to better understand DNA. She was looking at a very pure sample of DNA, which came in two forms, a crystalline A form and a less crystal-like B form. She was able to change the A into the B form under the microscope and in the X-ray beam simply by raising the relative humidity of the sample chamber. So that differentiates these two forms. This resolved the problem that had confused researchers for a while. Previously, experiments had used a mixture of A and B forms which were impossible to fully interpret. But this wasn't her only insight at this point. When Watson first got into the DNA problem, in November of 1951, he attends a seminar by Franklin. And in that seminar, she presented both A and B DNA and said they are big. Both of them were a big helix with the phosphate backbones on the outside with the bases pointing in, right? And gave some basic parameters of it that are essentially the ones that they used in, to solve the structure. So that was already known. So the famous photograph 51 of the B form of DNA is unlikely to have given Watson a sudden insight into DNA being a helix. As aside from Watson not really knowing much about X-ray crystallography, nobody really doubted DNA was a helix at this time. Matthew and Nathaniel also discovered a program from the Royal Society with a talk listed about the structure of DNA, and it was to be given by Crick, Watson, Wilkins, and Franklin. That wasn't all though. They also came upon an unpublished news article written for Time magazine. And this is the article that was supposed to go with the very famous pictures, which we've all seen now, of Watson and Crick in front of the model. So we knew these photos had been taken for Time magazine, but there was never any trace of this article. And then we find this in the Churchill College archives in Cambridge. And this article, which is a bit poor from a scientific point of view, which is probably why it didn't get published, presents the discovery precisely as a collaborative work between the King's people, Wilkins and Franklin on the one hand, and with Watson and Crick in Cambridge on the other, and presents it in a much more egalitarian approach. And this article was written in conjunction with Franklin. This account also tallies with the three original papers on the structure of DNA that were published in Nature in 1953. One was much more theoretical and came from Watson and Crick, whilst the other two came from Franklin and Wilkins and their teams and were much more data heavy. Now, at the time, Watson and Crick did say that the structure they had come up with, quote, rests mainly, though not entirely, on published experimental data and stereochemical arguments. However, this was shortly followed up by another paper where they acknowledged that without Franklin's data, quote, the formulation of our structure would have been most unlikely, if not impossible, unquote. But if the contemporary narrative was this one of collaboration, why is it that the story so many of us are familiar with is so different from this? What happened? Watson happened. And the double helix happened. That account that you and everybody else knows is derived from Watson's account in his 1968 book, The Double Helix. It is a very strange book. It's treated as as a historical account, but it's only partly historical. He makes stuff up. He takes literary license in the book. So he's taking a good story and he's embellishing it and turning it into this heroic discovery narrative, right? With all sorts of, you know, clandestine behavior and, and theft and jokes and all kinds of things, right? And so to make it a good story. And the book has been read as straight history. Instead of this complicated mix of history and fiction and science writing, it's sort of all rolled into one. The account given in The Double Helix was also challenged by Wilkins and Crick, who even tried to stop its publication, in part because of how the book's story dealt with Rosalind's contribution they were ultimately unsuccessful. Rosalind was unable to share her side of the story at that time, 
because she had died a decade before the book was published from ovarian cancer at the age of 37. For DNA, her contributions were vital. She differentiated the A and B forms of DNA, she determined that the DNA molecule was enormous, and figured out that there was a symmetry in the DNA. Much of this was actually communicated to Watson and Crick through a report from her and Wilkins. However, she died some years before DNA was fully recognised for the important molecule we now know it as, and before Wilkins, Crick and Watson won the Nobel Prize for its structure. We can only speculate about how the story of the discovery of DNA structure might have been told had Rosalind lived longer, or had that Time article detailing her contribution actually been published. Instead, Rosalind Franklin has become a figurehead for marginalised and overlooked scientists, but stories can distort how we see the real people behind them, because as much as she has become a symbol, Rosalind was also a real person. She was a super sort of dedicated, driven, passionate woman. This is Hannah Franklin, a PhD student at the Francis Crick Institute and University College London, and Rosalind's great niece. I should also say here that I have a personal connection to Hannah. She works with my wife. And so when I started looking into this story, I was interested to speak to her and ask about what she made of the way her great aunt is often talked about. She didn't suffer fools gladly. And I think people have that perception of her. And sometimes it's been misinterpreted as her being remembered as this quite cold character. And all she cared about was the science. But, you know, from what I've heard from family members, she was an amazing, warm woman. I've actually known Hannah for a few years now, and she makes no claims to be an expert on her great aunt but she has grown up hearing stories about her from the family members that knew her. From Hannah's perspective, as important as we now think of DNA, for Rosalind, the double helix wasn't even the most important part of her life's work. She made significant contributions in the space of viruses and coal and carbon, and that actually her time working on DNA were perhaps some of the unhappiest of her life. You know, at King's, she wasn't allowed into the senior common room, alongside her male counterparts, she wasn't allowed purely for being a woman. So when you think about in pubs and in common rooms, the sort of informal scientific conversations that take place, she wasn't a part of that. In fact, Rosalind's gravestone mentions her work on viruses, but nothing about DNA. It was a small part of a greater life's work. To put it simply, Rosalind was a more complex and full person than merely a victim of the discovery of DNA structure. In the end, painting Rosalind Franklin as a wronged heroine does her an injustice. She was an equal partner in the discovery of the structure of DNA. Stories about eureka moments and individual genius can be seductive, but they're rarely the truth, especially in the collaborative fields of science. So how should we remember Rosalind Franklin? So I think to be remembered for being a significant contributor in very impactful science and not just because of the obstacles that she faced and that she would have wanted to be remembered for the science and for the human that she was, not just put on this pedestal of being some hero because of the obstacles that she faced. So I think that's that's a really important message that I think and I've interpreted from the family is what they want her legacy to be. That was Hannah Franklin from UCL and the Francis Crick Institute here in the UK. You also heard from Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester, also in the UK, and Nathaniel Comfort from Johns Hopkins University in the US. To read Matthew and Nathaniel's comment article, head over to the show notes, where you'll also find links to all the other stories you'll hear in this year's clip show. In our 25th of October podcast, we had a story looking at how soundscapes and an artificial intelligence were combined to help researchers monitor forest biodiversity in Ecuador. And it's Noah Baker's pick of 2023. This story was one that Nick was originally going to cover, but then he wasn't able to finish the edit owing to a few bits and bobs. And so I took it over partway through and I was so thrilled to be able to do so because it was a story that really grabbed me. I think as an audio producer, any time that researchers are using sound in any way in their research, there's something particular that sparks in my head. 
And in this case, my background was also in ecology, conservation biology, way back when I used to study science. And so it combined a load of my passions, I suppose. And so to be able to bring these rich audio recordings of old growth forest, but also the sonically very different and interesting recordings of agricultural land or plantations into a piece of audio to help demonstrate some research which could have implications on things like carbon credits. I mean, what a fascinating combination of things to bring into one story. I really enjoyed making it and I hope you enjoy listening to it. This is the sound of a tropical forest in Ecuador. And ecosystems like this are vital. They matter for all humans living on this globe. Even if you are totally not interested in tropical forests, the tropical forests drive our climate. That's Jörg Müller, a conservation ecologist from the University of Würzburg in Germany. But as conservationists, you are interested in the second important topic. They host the highest terrestrial diversity on Earth. But forests around the world are facing a lot of challenges. Timber extraction, agriculture and other industries, along with climate change, are threatening tropical forests. And those challenges don't only change the landscape, they also change the sounds. As forests are converted to open farmland, new sounds appear. The balance of noise changes. Even the acoustics of the environment itself morph. And scientists are now asking if these changing soundscapes could provide them with an opportunity. In recent years, various efforts to reclaim agricultural land and restore forests have been launched, with a multitude of goals from carbon capture to biodiversity increases. But monitoring the progress of efforts like this is not always easy. After all, regrowth doesn't happen overnight, and it's impacted by many factors. This creates what scientists like Jörg refer to as a restoration gradient. Now, tools like satellite imagery can be used to quantify the regrowth of trees and plants, and by extension, estimate carbon capture. But wildlife regeneration? Well, let's hand back over to Jörg. This is much more difficult, from the se- or it's impossible from the satellites. Because it's very cryptic, you can imagine a small hummingbird, you can not easily track them from uh, the satellites. What we need is our standardized methods where we can investigate a whole gradient in time and space. And that's where the sounds come in. Jörg and his team wondered if soundscapes could provide another part of the solution. No method captures everything. Every method has some biases towards some species groups. And in this approach, we used all vocalizing uh, vertebrates, which is predominantly by birds and amphibians and a few mammals, uh, and then checked how they describe the gradient of forest recover over time. Whilst imperfect, Jörg still believed that analyzing soundscapes could provide a useful measure but they needed somewhere to test their theories. And they found it in the form of a reserve in Ecuador, created by an NGO. Inside the reserve or at the edges, you have forests which are still under agricultural use. And some areas are abundant now for two years, five years, 10 years, 34 years, something like that. And there are also old growth patches, so where you have primary forests. And so they set out to record soundscapes at a series of plots throughout the reserve. We did it everywhere. We set a recorder in all these plots along the gradient from active uh, agriculture over recovering forests to old growth forests. And then they set about analysing the data. So our starting point was that we selected from each plot the same minutes from two days within two weeks and hand over these to experts for birds and experts for amphibians. 
and they were able to identify a lot of animals on this sound, excellent. And this was our, let's say, gold standard, the starting point. But they didn't stop there. You see, these kinds of expert analyses can be very time consuming. And Jorg and his team had big ambitions. We use these plots to investigate the role of sound and AI to identify these communities. They wanted to automate the process using AI. And so on the same data, they used an acoustic index analysis. Now, that doesn't pick out individual species, but rather assesses sounds broadly based on fundamental sonic properties like frequency or pitch. But they also employed an AI-assisted program, specifically a neural network, which had been trained to identify 75 species of bird. These birds were from the region, but not from their specific plot. And they're only a relatively small subset of the animals which could be heard in the recordings. But Jorg hoped that it would still be enough to get a reasonable proxy. And indeed, the AI software was only able to pick out about half the species the experts did, owing to its limited training. But what stood out to Jorg and his team is that all their assessment methods tracked onto one another, and onto models of regeneration in the reserve, reliably predicting where on the regeneration gradient a forest sits. And that's something which Jorg says is not always easy to tell, even for experts in the field. As an ornithologist, sometimes it's hard to see if this is a recovery forest or already an old growth. So you are in the forest, there are a lot of trees around you after 30 years of tree growth, some of them grow one meter or more per year, and then it's hard to, to identify what's going on. But if you ask the birds, they show you exactly, it's, this is an old growth or this is still a recovery forest. So ask the birds and they tell you something about the progress is the story in a nutshell. And their data showed something else. The best indicator they found of the status of regeneration wasn't the number of species recorded, but rather the composition of the species in an area. The number of species is a very weak indicator. And what is the reason? I would like to explain it in a very simple example. So if you go there to an agriculture farmland, then you will find a bunch of birds. And you can record, let's say you find 10 birds there in one morning. And then you go to the old growth and you find also 10 birds. So when you compare, there is no difference. But in fact, these are totally different species. And what we learned is the species in the agriculture land are species which are common more southern parts of South America where the habitats are naturally more open. And therefore, it turned out that the community composition, so the similarity in species, it's a much better indicator to describe the pattern of recovering biodiversity. Now, this automated system isn't perfect. For one thing, there are many, many animals that don't make prominent sounds and so weren't detected by the system. But Jorg still thinks that the measurements are useful. In fact, he tested it by comparing their analyses with a totally independent data set. So, of course, this is a crucial question. And at first, we have to say soundscape are about vocalizing animals. That's it. But in our study, we combined the data preliminary with another data set, which was based just on metabarcoding, so sequencing bulks of insects collected with light traps. So they have nothing to do with our sound, and there are almost no vocalizing insects in this data set. And what we saw is that it's quite well correlated even with our sound indices, which indicates that um, the birds are very integrative uh, and if the birds are shifting their the species composition, even other communities are shifting. And so maybe birds can be used as a major surrogate for this uh, recovery forest. But this is too early to say that overall, because we have not correlated this to soil diversity, uh, for example, or plant diversity. This is just an assumption which has to be tested further. More work needs to be done, but Jörg sees systems like this opening up new opportunities, for example in the emerging biodiversity credit market. In these models, landowners are paid by companies, individuals, even governments, to focus their efforts on regeneration of biodiversity. The idea works in a similar way to carbon credits and offsets, but those kinds of transactions require reliable reporting mechanisms. And there are no tools available at the moment, and we, can, we have no solution. So we come in, in our area, we can easily say, okay, 
this is the status of your area now. You collect sound data and five years or 10 years later, you do it again. And we can say exactly, you are more close now to the primeval forest by 20%. And this is paid. And this is really serious, well-recorded baseline data and can make uh, yeah, a baseline for this new upcoming market. So what's next for the system? And as AI has become more prominent, does this spell the end for the expert ecologist? Well, Jörg thinks not. Yeah, I, I think it needs definitely both sides of the coin. So we need the expert in the long run, we will further develop these AI models with the help of expert identification that they label specific species and provide the SNPs and say this sound SNP is exactly this species. And then you can feed your AI models with that. So the models are hungry, data hungry, and without the expert, we cannot feed them. Then the expert will never be able to run millions of sound files, but AI can do that. And this is the big advantage. So I think we need the both sides um, and in principle it works. So the scientifically, the, the story is done. Now we need better uh, labels from still missing species in the AI models to have better models and then we can run it on large scale. So often people fear that now the experts are run out of jobs, but in fact it's vice versa. So people are more and more interested in their expertise than ever before. That was Jörg Müller from the University of Würzburg in Germany. This piece was produced by Noah Baker and Nick Petrich Howe. The middle of the podcast is normally where we have the research highlights, and this show is no different. Here's Dan Fox, who read the majority of them this year with his 2023 research highlight, Highlights. Sometimes the key to a good research highlight can be as simple as an interesting animal or a good joke. So this year, I've picked two stories about understanding both better. Earlier this year, researchers cracked the tricky challenge of measuring the brainwaves of an octopus. While more recently, we learned the effects of a classic 90s sitcom on the human brain. Researchers have measured the brain activity of a freely moving octopus for the first time. Octopuses are among the most intelligent invertebrates on the planet, but catching a glimpse of the inner workings of their brains isn't easy. That's in no small part because the animals tend to remove any devices, like the ones that could measure brain activity, that are attached to their bodies. But now researchers have been able to surgically implant a recording device in an inner cavity below the skin. The devices then connect to electrodes placed in the animal's brains. The implants allowed the team to measure the brain activity of three octopuses for a full 12 hours, during which time the octopuses behaved normally, aside from exploring the incision site with their arms. The recording showed patterns that resembled mammalian brain activity, as well as some that had not been previously reported. The researchers say this could provide an experimental platform for better understanding these creatures. Reach for that research over in Current Biology. Sometimes you don't need to understand the joke to find it funny. And sometimes no amount of explanation can make a gag work for you. Now neuroscientists know that understanding a joke and finding it funny are distinct processes in the human brain. Researchers studied the brain activity of 26 people as they consumed humorous material. The participants first listened to 40 jokes and 40 neutral sentences that were played in a random order. After hearing each clip, participants had to decide whether it was a joke and rate how funny it was. Next, they watched an episode of the sitcom Seinfeld and completed a questionnaire to assess whether they enjoyed the comedy. Brain activity during both experiments showed that understanding a joke involves activity in two brain areas, the dorsal striatum, which has a role in memory and cognition, and the ventral striatum, which responds to reward. But actually enjoying the joke only involved the ventral striatum. 
Both areas are rich in the chemical messenger dopamine, and the team suggests that dopamine signaling could play an important role in humour processing, opening avenues for further investigation. What's the deal with that research? Find out in the Journal of Neuroscience. Dan Fox there with his pick of this year's research highlights. Next up on the show, it's me with my choice for 2023. Now, I always enjoy going back over the last 12 months and looking at what I've made stories about. Some of the ones that stood out to me this year included hearing from a researcher in Uganda about designing a mini MRI scanner for use in rural settings or small clinics, how sticking a powerful laser on top of a tower in the Swiss Alps allowed a team to direct the path of lightning, and a star caught in the act of eating a planet. But I haven't gone for any of those. I've gone for a story about memory in fruit flies. And when I first saw the paper, it reminded me of an experience I'd had, and one that I think will be familiar to a lot of folk. So without further ado, here's my pick of 2023. For our second story, I've decamped to a stairwell here at Nature Towers to take a big sniff of the air. And this actually does have something to do with a research paper about memory that's coming out in Nature this week. You see, earlier this year I was walking up these very stairs and I got a faint whiff of a very specific smell. The lemon scented cleaning product they use on the floors here. Not unusual, I hear you cry, but you know what? That smell was exactly the same as the one I used to smell 25 years ago, as it was used to clean the student accommodation I lived in when I started at university. As soon as I could smell it, bam, I was back in my room all that time ago. I could see it perfectly in my mind, and I could hear my flatmates yelling at each other while they played yet another round of Goldeneye on the Nintendo 64. It was like I was back there. And you know what? It turns out that memories and multisensory experiences are tightly linked. Most organisms live in a multisensory world, and research has shown that experiences that involve different senses can improve memory strength, compared to those that involve a single sense. Zeynep Okrai from the University of Oxford will explain while I head back to my desk. We've seen this in scientific studies. For example, in one of these studies with humans, the audiovisual cues helped memory performance more than just having a visual cue or an auditory cue. And this holds true also for insects and rodents and controlled experiments. Studies have suggested that when you're making memories about something using multiple senses, the different parts of the brain involved with those senses will all be working. It seems that interactions happen between these areas, which increases the strength of a memory. And later on, if one sensory part of that memory gets activated, say the smell part, other sensory memories, say visual ones, can be activated too. Like how the smell of the cleaning product fired up the visual memories of my student flat, for example. Actually working out exactly how this happens has been tough though. But this week, Zeynep and her colleagues have a paper in Nature that details a mechanism for how this might work in the brains of fruit flies. To find it, they had to give these fruit flies a multi-sensory experience. Now, these animals are good at discerning between odours and colours. So the team set up experiments where fruit flies learnt to associate a reward, sugar, with a specific smell, a specific colour, or a combination of the two. Later, the flies were tested to see if they preferentially chose those over a non-reward-related colour, odour, or combo. Essentially, did they remember what was associated with the reward? And what we found is that the flies learned better if they had both the colours and odours to make that association. So if they learned with only one sense, then their memory was sort of standard. If they learned with two senses, their memory was improved. And what was also interesting is that even when there was only one cue, so either color or odor, the flies performed better if they had initially learned with two cues, so both color and odor to start with. So learning with two senses boosted the fly's ability to remember even if they were later presented with an experience that only triggered one. This sort of thing has been seen before, but because the fruit fly brain and all the cells and connections it contains have been so well mapped out, Zeynep and her colleagues could zoom in to see exactly what was going on. And they looked in a specific area of the fruit fly brain known as the mushroom body, known to be involved in remembering experiences. 
the mushroom body is what we consider the center for learning and memory in FOIS, where the sensory information is integrated with the meaning of the experience. So basically with, for example, is it a pleasant experience or a bad experience? And then it skews the behavior directing neurons afterwards. So the team looked at the activity of neurons within the mushroom body to see what was happening in fruit flies, which had had a multisensory learning experience. During learning, the neurons that encoded the different sensory information, they got connected. So there are these cells that are odor selective normally. They don't respond to colors. And what happens if the animal learns with odors and colors is that these odor selective cells now become responsive to colors. So with one color, you can activate both the odor cells and the visual cells. And the reverse was true as well, with the color-related cells being activated by those involved with odor. But how? Were these two groups of cells directly talking with each other? Well, the team think that's unlikely, as direct connections between the two are sparse. Instead, it looked like a third player was involved that wired the two together. We call it an interneuron, so it's a big, big, big hefty neuron that sort of covers almost like a net over all of the sensory encoding cells. This interneuron is vital to complete this circuit between the two groups, and it produces the neurotransmitter serotonin, which looks to have an important role in this crosstalk between the two, and allows one sensory memory to recall those associated with another. Basically what happens is that the other information comes in, it's activating the other responsive cells, and then this activates the interneuron, and that excitation carries over to the visual stream. But this begs the question, when the fruit fly smells something familiar, is it also picturing the entire scene in its mind's eye, much like I can picture my student room when I smell the right cleaning product? What would a mental representation look like in the fly? This is an interesting question. To anthropomorphize is difficult, but indeed I think what's happening is that maybe it's not seeing it, but there's definitely a neural representation of all the components. What this means for the fly, I, I don't really know, but we also do know that it uses it to guide its behavior. So perhaps it sort of is kind of aware that there's more to the story. And there's likely to be more to the story of this brain circuit too. The team are still trying to figure out exactly how it works and exactly how the system leads to the creation of stronger memories. There's the big question as well, of course, of whether this work is relevant to other animals. But Zeynep says that finding this circuit, which explains how a single stimulus input can lead to multiple memory outputs, is a start. And it could help unravel more about how multisensory experiences can influence learning, memory generation, and ultimately maybe why a lemon scent can take me back to the past. We do believe that our work might reveal general principles about the neural circuits that underlie this behavior. We don't, of course, know that this is the case in higher mammals, but I think some of the fundamentals of what we discovered might hold true. It's important for us to understand the neural circuit mechanisms of memory and different forms of memory, because changes in our memory function are quite relevant to society as we age, as cognition changes during aging, and also for neurodegenerative diseases as well. From our 26th of April show, that was Zeynep Okrai from the University of Oxford here in the UK. We round out each edition of The Nature Podcast with The Briefing Chat, where we discuss a couple of stories that have been covered in The Nature Briefing. One of those stories was chosen by Sharmini Bundell as her pick of the year. So I have dug back into the archives. I've gone back to May and it's a really cute story about elephant seals taking power naps. There unfortunately isn't cute pictures of snoozing seals because they do this while they're diving deep down into the pitch black depths of the sea. But yeah, really interesting story. I seem to have covered a lot about sleep this year. I did a video about octopuses dreaming as well. So maybe I've got sleep on the mind. But yeah, cute elephant seals, they're very interesting sleep patterns. And here's Nick and I discussing it on the briefing chat. Well, if you'll allow me a little segue, how about from the darkest depths of a black hole to the dark depths of the ocean? 
um, for my story. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Which is, yeah. Um, leaving, leaving space aside, I have been reading, uh, oh, this is such an interesting bit of research, reading about it in the New York Times. It's a science paper and it's about elephant seals and how they dive down into the dark ocean and take little power naps while they're down there. Okay, so are they like getting to the bottom of the ocean, sort of laying down, having a little nap at the bottom? <laughs> it doesn't seem particularly no. safe. <laughs> no, well, so the thing is that these elephant seals spend seven months a year. This is some research being done on elephant seals in California. This is massive, great seals, but they have to eat a huge amount. So they spend seven months of the year just eating fish and squid and things like that out at sea. Not bad life. Yeah. And when they're doing these short power naps during this time, they're only sleeping two hours a day. And, you know, when they're back on land for the other months a year, they actually spend a huge amount of time sleeping. They love sleeping, possibly because they're not eating at that point. They're sleeping over 10 hours a day. But on land, they don't really have any predators. Whereas in the sea, you've got killer whales, you've got sharks. It's a little bit of a dangerous time. And especially these predators hang out near the surface. So the surface is the danger zone so your idea about just sort of drifting to the bottom uh is not so bad um but what they actually do is they do this great big dive and as they're going down deeper and deeper they sort of start moving through different stages of sleep and at one point this research has found and this tends to be once you get down to the level at which it would be pitch dark for us basically they go into actual REM sleep and have mm. the same sort of kind of like sleep paralysis that we have where they're sort of completely out of it basically it would be really dangerous if if a shark came along at that point so that's why they have to do it so low down and the researchers have found that they sort of drift and sometimes they kind of flip upside down so their kind of belly is up and they're just kind of spiraling down like a sort of falling leaf oh. um, and it's only for maybe 10 minutes they have these quick power naps and then they just sort of wake up and swim back up to the surface again and then carry on with all their feeding it doesn't sound like it would be safer but i guess like you said the predators are near the surface so it makes sense to go down lower but how are the researchers figuring this out i i, I find it hard to believe that elephant seals keep like a dream diary or something so how do they know <laughs> <laughs> dream journal of the, of the <laughs> deep ocean uh, deep ocean rem so you know different marine mammals in particular because they have to come back up to the surface to breathe sleeping at sea can be quite hard so you know different mammals have different ways of doing it so some kind of fur seals and dolphins and things do that unihemispheric sleep thing so you know they'll sleep with half their brain at a time i don't know if you've heard that and like have one eye open so, you know, if a predator comes along, they can be awake really quickly and run away. But this researcher wanted to know, okay, how do the elephant seals manage it? So she invented a kind of device like a sort of electroencephalography device. So it can read brain waves, heart rates, as well as logging where the, the seal is, so kind of the depth and how they're moving. And it kind of looks like a little swim cap. They just sort of like stick it on top of the of the seal's head that they were monitoring. And it's recording all that data. So they've got sort of diagrams almost of where these seals are going, this sort of spinning behavior as they get to the bottom and their sort of brain waves and sort of where in the sleep cycle they are at each point. I mean, does it tell us anything more about how they've adapted to their sort of diving lifestyle or does it tell us anything more about how we sleep or anything like that? Well, it's definitely an extreme example of sort of having different types of sleep for different situations. So the research was quoted as saying they exhibit unparalleled flexibility in their sleep duration. And she said, no other mammal goes from sleeping about two hours a day for over 200 days to sleeping 10.8 hours a day. And she also says that she hopes it would actually potentially aid in protecting elephant seals and other marine mammals, understanding their sleep, understanding where they're sleeping, when and where they're sleeping, and help scientists sort of improve the, the management of their habitats. Sharmini there talking with Nick from the briefing chat on our 3rd of May show. You can find a link to that story and all the others in this podcast in the show notes. 
So that is very much that for this year's clip show. Loads of great stuff in there. I'm sure you'll agree. Thanks, as always, for being with us over the last 12 months. If you've enjoyed what you've heard and would like to leave us a nice review or some stars, that would be very much appreciated. We'll be back in 2024 with more stories from the wide world of science. Until then, I've been Benjamin Thompson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>